Hi, my name is Vivian Aqua and welcome to this version of Let's Humanize the Workplace. And I am a workplace wellness advocate and today it's going to be a, an awesome panel. I'm not going to introduce them yet, but before I'm going to, you know, start with the goodies of today, I just wanted to highlight um, a few people that I've met during the way. So, um, Let's humanize the workplace is something that started with Orlando. For those of you who don't know Orlando yet, I refer to him a lot. He's my son. He's my six-year-old son. And he is my all. He is my life coach. He is uh, the person, my, my reason, my mirror to do whatever I need to do. And also the reason why I started Let's Humanize the Workplace. And uh, if you want to know more, about humanizing the workplace, or if you want to know more about me, just reach out and connect and let's see what we can do. Um, I also want to share something good for you because um, for those of you who are on my news list, and this is my news list, so go to bit.ly hashtag, uh, sorry, go to bit.ly uh, dash HTW news because I am going to ask my subscribers, those who are on my list to share uh, questions. If they have any questions or if they want to decide on the topics, I need your help. So if you want to be in that seat, if you want to share or if you just want to share an awesome guest or if you just want me to ask your question, please join this list and I will let you know that I'm definitely going to include your questions and topics. So I need your help. I really need your help. Also note that this broadcast is also available on uh, the famous uh, podcast platform. So if you are more of an auditive listener like me, um, I consume more audiobooks than reading. And I love to, you know, love to listen back to all these episodes because it's really valuable just to focus on the voice and just to focus on the content and... Uh, you have enough options. So if you're driving or if you're going to work or if you're going elsewhere, know that you can consume it in your own pace at your own time. And before I'm going to pull up the guests, I do have to share the definition. And I also would like to uh, let you know that you can jump in. So if you have any questions during this episode or you want to share your own story, please share them. But before I'm going to start, I have to share the definition of imposter syndrome, and I'm going to read it out loud. So imposter syndrome can be, according to Harvard Business Review, imposter syndrome can be defined as a collection of feeling of inadequacy that persists despite evident success. Imposters suffer from chronic self-doubt and a sense of intellectual fraudulence that override any feelings of success or external proof of their competence. They seem unable to internalize their accomplishments, however successful they are in their field. High achieving, highly successful people often suffer so imposter syndrome doesn't equate for with low self-esteem or lack of self-confidence. In fact, some researchers have linked it to perfectionism. And it's also something that they have also linked that a lot of women are suffering from it. So even though the panel is consisting for it with a lot of women, it doesn't mean that this syndrome, this imposter syndrome only is only affecting women. So men, please jump in if you want to share something or share a story or how you, you know, how you overcome your own imposter syndrome, because this platform is to inspire you is to inspire uh, your friend or family member. So if you know about somebody or if you can share this, this uh, broadcast, please do, so that other people can know how to recognize the imposter syndrome and beat their imposter syndrome. So I'm going to bring them in one by one. And let me see. Let me move. Uh, so. And I'm also going to read out loud their bio. This is technology. First of all, Melissa Romero. She is a purpose-driven go-getter. She is living her purpose of giving others a voice and helping close the gender gap by starting Lean in Netherlands to shape a new definition of leadership. 
Next is Andrea Yora Burosu. She is a senior manager, transfer pricing, business modeling expert at EY. And throughout her 10 year career, she has led in international high performing teams and being an advocate of personalized career experience. Daniela Valetti is a diversity and an inclusion educator, inclusive headhunter, and an executive career advisor. Lara Manqui is a, an empowerment coach, professional speaker, vlogger, and also an electronics engineer. She has, she has lovely work with many women in tech to help them strive professionally. And last but not least, Nasli Yenis is a global people leader who has a passion for self-development to grow and to thrive. And she founded Blink Minds where she brings the power of purpose. Welcome ladies. How is everybody? Great, Good. thank you for having Thank you. Us. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. The first question, and I'm going to just shuffle, shuffle the name. So the first question that I have is, what is your connection with humanizing the workplace? And if you can keep it brief so that, you know, everybody gets the chance to share it. And I will start with Daniela. Wow. Well, my connection with humanizing is you. <laughs> <laughs> first, uh, in first place, uh, and I've been actually during my work um, as a DNI uh, professional. Uh, the sense of belonging—it's all about humanizing the workplace, right? Changing culture and uh, considering humans first. Okay, and, uh, and Andrea, thank you. Well, I've been working in uh, consulting throughout my career, uh, and I've uh, worked for the past seven years in a very international uh, environment. Uh, and that, in a way, um, forced me to acknowledge that my perspectives are not the only ones out there. So for me, every day and every interaction with someone in the office is actually a step towards humanizing the workplace. Um, and obviously, throughout my career, I've also learned more about how to look at the career goals and how to have really uh, customized a career path, not just following whatever is, you know, in an HR manual available for everyone. So mm -hmm. I think that that's uh, my connection. And obviously you are uh, I'm following you quite, uh, quite uh, frequently. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And Lara? So I worked in corporate for 10 years. And after that, I became an empowerment coach. And I worked in technology, and I was always, I was always one of the few women working in technology in, in the environments where I worked. And um, a few years back, I realized that uh, this environment really pushed me to be unhuman. And, and what I've been trying to do now with my work is helping um, women who work in technology to actually realize that the human part is the most important part professionally, in, in my opinion. So... That's what I do. And Melissa. Yes, thanks, Vivian. Um, yeah, well, obviously, with humanizing the workplace, your show is is you. Um, you're a very present also and, and valued member of the community of Leading Netherlands, of course. But as you know, our mission is to help redefine the definition of leadership reshape the, the definition of leadership that is very outdated. So that includes also making it more, more human and enabling every single human being, no matter their gender, race, sexual preference, etc., to actually make it and succeed by not by changing and fitting into an old mold, but simply by being 100% themselves. So that I would say very much links with our mission at Lini Netherlands and humanizing the workplace. Thank you. Nasli? Hi, Vivian. Um, so I, I put greater emphasis on people's, um, you know, finding the power of their purpose and and who they are and uh, and bringing their through an authentic self to workplaces. I think which is a great, um, great um, thing to do to humanize mm -hmm. the workplaces. And, and and definitely it's you. When I talk to you, my son has been very inspired, you know, inspiring for me to just actually sound, you know, blink minds and just following my purpose. So humanizing your workplaces seems to be you know, like a good place to start and bringing your authentic self. Thank you, thank you. So I will you know, start with the, the tough question. When was the first time you experienced your imposter syndrome? And I will start with Andrea. 
Well, I actually recall it was sometime in high school. Um, mm -hmm. I was 15 uh, years old, and um, I was um, uh, going to a national mathematics uh, competition for uh, in, in back in Romania. And I remember I thought I don't belong there. Um, mm -hmm. It was the first time I got, ever got admitted, and it I realized that now looking back, that that feeling will also influence how much effort you put into something. And when I got the results, I got a, a prize for some creative way of solving uh, a problem. And I remember I was not surprised that I won that award because I knew I had a different approach, but still I. I still felt out of place, even if mm -hmm. I knew that I had good ideas and a good way of, uh, you know, just showing my math skills. So that sounds was my first Sounds familiar, right, to ladies? And, and uh, Nasli? Um, yeah, so um, my first uh, imposter, you know, syndrome experience, I think it started um, in 2012. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm pretty sure I had one, you know, when I was 15 years old, but the one that I remember it was 2012 when I moved, um, you know, from US and moved to Istanbul. Um, so um, on the same year, I was, I found out that I was pregnant um, mm -hmm. and I was starting like a new city, a new home, you know, with new roles um, and I was becoming a mom. So everything seemed to be very new and different to me. Um, and, you know, even the using the, like a Turkish language, I mean, if I was born from there, it's, um, it's, it, in a way that it was very challenging. So I think I believe it started with, you know, anxiety and fear and lack of confidence when I first started my job. Um, and I was getting ready to just to do, um, just to succeed and do what was expected or right thing to do. I mean, at least mm -hmm. that, that's what I have assumed. Okay, and Daniela? Well, uh, to be honest, I think I had it all my life but uh, I can't say when exactly I started it, because probably teenager, but I can tell when I first learned <laughs> like about it, then I started recognizing it in the, the past. So becoming an entrepreneur helped me go through like the self-development work and actually realize, oh, so that was happening in this company <laughs> or when I was studying or so many others uh, situations where we don't think about it, you think you're our problem, right? But then uh, you realize actually it has been repeating like for your whole life. And uh, yeah, that's it, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Melissa? <laughs> this is really funny because I had a similar one to Andreas. Um, I recall also being in my early teens and indeed they, they were called the, the olympians the olympics of math mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was something very similar um but actually it, that was the very first time but i think it just kept on repeating it because when i graduated then from high school i went on to studying industrial engineering and basically normally you start with a path of mathematics that is you know with algebra um but depending on your kind of the colombian sat the the you know the, the national exam very few people could start then with calculus, which is quite, you know, a level up or the second semester people would go through it. And uh, I was one of the three people in my class that started with calculus and I was the only girl. Uh, the other two were, were uh, two guys. And um, I also thought like somebody's going to figure out. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to figure out that <laughs> I don't belong here. Although I did have in math the best SAT scores in my class. Um, and um, yeah, I only identify that indeed as imposter syndrome. Obviously, years later, once you finally come across the definition and you say, ah, OK, this is it. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, it, it is, I think, very curious. And it's not only Andrea and I, I think girls have this a lot with mathematics and more like STEM fields, um, I believe, because of the way we've been conditioned uh, growing up. But Definitely. I think we'll talk more about it later. <laughs> <laughs> and Lara? Um, similar to what Daniela mentioned, I think that I've had, I ha or I had during my whole life, this sensation, this kind of fear that, you know, I didn't belong or I was a fraud or people were expecting so much from me and they thought that, 
you know, I was doing it, but it wasn't. Um, and my memories of that is very, very young, very mm -hmm. young. I remember um, a science fair where I, I, I made this kind of like this, um, it was like this little movie film thing. Well, it was, and they were asking me questions and I just froze because I felt like I didn't know anything. I didn't know absolutely anything. And so um, what I feel that this has a lot to do with is a lot of pressure that I felt from my parents mm -hmm. and just trying, trying to, like, to show up as a lot of people saw me. Mm -hmm. And um, a, different, a little bit different from what Daniela mentioned, I didn't realize this until very, very late in my career, I mean, just a few years ago, that I had gone and put so much pressure to myself during my whole life. So. Yeah. Definitely. I, mm -hmm. I totally can relate to that because for me, I realized that I suffered early on of uh, imposter syndrome. But the first time that I do recognize was uh, when I was starting at KPMG. It was my first, let's say my first official job. And I felt like a fraud because I'm the, mm -hmm. the only black woman. Uh, at the time I was wearing colors, so not purple, but brown and um I was the odd one who was working for KPMG. So I felt like even though my family was very proud and a lot of friends were, you know, very proud, it was for me a conflicted way of be working for a company, feeling fraudulent and not um, thinking that I don't fit here, but I do fit here. So you have these conflict conversations with yourself. I call it the, the two aunties. Uh, you have these conflicting conversations with yourself where you know that you are at your place, but then again, somebody is saying something to you that somebody is you saying to you that you are not, you know, this is not the right place for you. You should be able to work somewhere else because KPMG is, you know, the top five uh, company that uh, a lot of people are working for. So um, that's what I can say. And um, coming back to Daniela, when did you feel like an imposter or why did you feel like an imposter? Can you maybe help the people to recognize the, 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 the things that you felt at the time? Sure. Um, well, as an entrepreneur, I think we have it like very often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every time you need to promote a business, promote yourself, put your face you know, no. uh, there as you are doing now. <laughs> <So laughs> thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you, your pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not easy because no, he, really. in my case, I was educated to be an employee. Mm -hmm. uh, I was never really taught to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So when I decided it was because I wanted to be my own boss, I was fed up of uh, going through so many things. I was learning about uh, humans it was like perception in the society and how I can actually control it by being my own boss, but actually mm -hmm. it wasn't really easy. And uh, I, I struggled in the beginning, actually, um, like feeling the fear of putting your face there, you know, in my website. I didn't want to put my picture for a long time. And then I finally put it, but I was afraid of people judging me. Mm -hmm. uh, who she thinks she, uh, she is, well, you yeah. know. Uh, when you talk about things that uh, actually you were, you you believe in that and you studied and you actually specialized to yourself and you are still fearing that you are gonna be not enough, that you were fraud, not legitimate because there is people uh, always better than you. Yeah. It's just this mm -hmm. feeling which is, I think, coming, it's coming from the perception from society and the, from mm -hmm. education. I think it starts from home, right? When, uh, like, uh, I don't want to blame my parents, but they were, teach they were taught like this, but they, they passed through as well. So complimenting are uh, asking too much from the kid, you know, like uh, brings you this perfectionist that uh, mm -hmm. described it in Harvard Business uh, yeah. Review. So I think this is the, the key uh, point of my feeling, this imposter syndrome, how my perfectionism was actually calling myself to, hey, what's going on? <laughs> no, you were good on that. Like review everything, learn more about yourself. And then I started learning about uh, human behavior, 
uh, educating myself, um, mm -hmm. myself first and then the others. Okay, and Nasli? Yeah. Um, so I felt like um, imposter, um, I guess, through the life changing experiences, you know, like trigger my feelings and emotions um, in a way that I was trying to be a superwoman, you know, perfectionist. And I was pushing myself, um, you know, to work harder than um, than those around me. You know, I, I had the I had to feel the, the need of, um, you know, like to succeed in all aspects of life, you mm -hmm. know, as, as, as a parent. Um, at, at work, um, as a wife, you know, and this feels like a stress, you know, every time you feel like you're not accomplishing something, um, you know, it's overwhelming feeling that you don't, you don't, you don't deserve your success or, or the question, the fact, are you successful? You know, you're going to like a different, um, different environment and you're just, you know, like judging yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just myself, like I was seeing myself as, you know, I'm not as intelligent, you know, creative and, and talented as I might seem. Um, so I overwork myself. Um, failure wasn't an option. Um, you know, it's, you know, pretending to know um, what you're doing at work and then, you know, coming home and then pretending to know, like, how to be a mom. So it's just less of, you know, like a pretending and not being yourself. Um, and it, of course, you know, like when you have this self-doubt, you know, it just, this is why I just felt it that you know you are not good enough like i'm not good enough i'm not worthy and then and the people around you and then um it just kind of realizes you know that you're draining yourself but it's it's difficult to kind of recognize it um and just listening you know daniela you know with blink minds like recently for the past three months you know i i feel like it was gone but it's not because i was feeling exactly the same way uh just you know looking at your pictures you know are you going to be judged you know am i going to be you know like speaking English or am I going to just, you know, like mess up, you know, like whatever I'm saying. So that, that feeling of, you know, uh, it, it's still, it's still there, but at mm -hmm. least like maybe more like, I'm more like aware of those feelings than it yeah. was before. Yeah. And Melissa? Um, yeah, I, I think Indeed, I, I think, you know, it will be complementary to what uh, Daniela and Nasli also were bringing on. But I, I just, you know, going back to the way that we are primed or the way that we are just put in these boxes and frames and and to no extent, indeed, we we can't, you know, point uh, at our parents for being bad parents. They were doing whatever they thought was the very best uh, to raise the very best, you know, most lovingly way uh, to raise kids um, but I think it also says a lot of how society throughout generations and generations you know they also could try to repeat the good things that they thought they were good and try to avoid the things that they didn't like from their own way of being raised and um, and you know so I, I also come from a family that was uh, very much strivers right and that um, they were asking for me to bring A's or tens, you know, or really good, good grades. And, you know, sometimes I, I wouldn't bring a 10, but a nine and a half. And sometimes I would get the question and I, I know this will sound horrible. Sorry, mom, I love you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I would get the question like, oh, nine and a half. Yeah. So what happened? Like, <laughs> how much did Kathy get? Like, I mean, not not like that, but but really like um, being confronted with with that with, oh, damn i'm so sorry this was not good enough so yeah. since you're being primed since a little age that it needs to be not good it needs to be really good if not yeah. perfect <laughs> um which i guess to you know i also have to thank my determination and perseverance and and you know kind of the the go-getter part of me but also a lot of the demons <laughs> that hold me back come from that time like yeah. imposter syndrome of course yeah I, I recognize that in the way I was uh, brought up. So I uh, I know that my parents did the best that they could. But one of the things that I don't like is they did the comparison game to the extent that it was to me. I didn't even at the moment at the point I didn't even listen to it. And I have two brothers and one sister behind me. And now my parents use me as look at Vivian, look at what they are doing. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. no, I, we should, you know, everybody should be held to, upon their own standards. They are all unique. They are all brave in their own way. 
and look at them. But it's I don't know if it's a non-Western thing or maybe an African thing. There is such a thing that we look upon what's outside. The grass is always greener, we we assume. But let's let's focus on the inside. And I also, um, before going to Andrea and Lara, I also want to share a comment that uh, a user, uh, uh, somebody who's watching shared. So they're sharing great topic uh, and discussion, ladies. It's interesting that imposter syndrome emerges for women from an early age, being given that negative messages that they are not good enough or don't belong, especially in the predominantly male arenas, time for women to claim their value and talent and place in all fields of level. So Andrea, what's your answer to this? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that, um, uh, first of all, yeah, you are primed as a child, you know, to give your best, but mm -hmm. also this continues uh, in uh, in the workplace and in uh, yeah. also in corporate environments, because then when you talk about uh, performance criteria, uh, these are set very high, but uh, if they are not set in accordance to the people's values and the way their skill set, their, their personal skill set, then it can also contribute to some people really feeling like an imposter of not, not achieving enough uh, in, in their view if they are really uh, yeah, primed in, in, uh, in that way. So I would say that um, indeed having a predominantly male environment will contribute to that because you will not have uh, maybe the um, um, openness to share that you feel in a certain way. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's quite uh, quite uh, difficult. Um, but it, if that is the only thing stopping us from not feeling the imposter syndrome, then maybe that's the way to go, right? Have more discussions about it. Uh, but I have a feeling that even that will not completely solve solve the problem if it's so it's, internal. It's a good start. It's a good point that you brought on that uh, we need definitely need more women. We need more diversity. And we also need to know from each other that it is okay to feel that way. It is okay yeah. to think, you know, you have. I have my good days and I have my some not so good days. Uh, because I am human, I also bleed, I also cry, and I also get angry. And sometimes we tend to forget that we have a human side. You know, mm -hmm. we we are human. Yeah. Lara. So just answering a little bit that message, it mm -hmm. mentions something about this negative message that you get from an early age. In my case, I think that it was... Um, well, it was very intended as a very good message. You can do it all. You can reach for the best. And there was kind of no space to, to fail. There was no space to be normal. Yeah. And so uh, my situation, I always felt that I wasn't doing it perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. it, it had to be perfect. And it was a bar that I could never reach because it, it doesn't exist. And then in the workplace, I feel that um, we can be a bit, bit more open to see when people are putting themselves in that place. Nobody ever said to me, hey, don't you think that maybe you're putting too much pressure on yourself? Nobody ever said that to me, right? It was good that I was striving and striving and striving, but that's the thing. I wanted to do something that was impossible and then I, I would show to myself that I was a fraud. And so it was a... Um, uh, how do you say it? a vicious circle cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I do also believe that um, dealing with this imposter syndrome, when it goes to um, a, a certain level, maybe a, um, a negative level, it can also contribute to you being stressed all the time or feeling uh, you have to tip on your toes all the time and also contribute towards a, a burnout. So please be very mindful of of if you recognize after this show, if you recognize some of the things, reevaluate if there is something that is within your control. If not, please seek out help or please, you know, contact a coach or somebody else or talk to somebody so that you learn how to recognize uh, some of the symptoms. So uh, maybe combine that with the next question. Um, maybe ladies, can you share two of the symptoms that you recognize and also what did you do to, um, getting rid of it? It was something that we discussed before. 
um, maybe share the way how you are getting rid of your, your imposter syndrome. So I will start with Melissa. Yes, I was on mute, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so right before we started the show, we were discussing about mm -hmm. the fact that uh, has the, have we ever gotten rid of the imposter syndrome or have we just moved past a different type of imposter syndrome? Clearly, I am not anymore afraid of going to the math Olympics or um, starting with calculus because I already graduated a while ago um, and, and, you know, that was good. Um, I think what we can say is that or in my case, at least, is I have just pressed on because part of this prime uh, priming and this pushing, uh, you know, makes and, and this fear of failure actually makes you just keep on going. And at the end of the day, it was just like, OK, just ignore the big elephant in the room, which is the imposter syndrome and, you know, keep keep moving because uh, otherwise, you know, what you say, there can be a really, really bad consequences like falling into a depression or a burnout or something like that. Um, but um, luckily in my case, I think I also was always somebody very optimistic and somehow, you know, without being very religious or very, you know, um, how do you say like, um, yeah, spiritual or something like that. I always did believe kind of in, in the power of positivity and, and always looking at the glass half full. And mm -hmm. I always journaled a lot, even since I was a teenager, I, you know, without having a coach or, and nobody telling me anything, I used to like write down in a, in, in, a, in a small notebook, like I'm feeling bad because of this and this and this, and this is what makes me feel really bad. And then I would write in the separate paper, like, okay, but I am really good at this. I got into the calculus class I, and I would like break or burn the, the paper with the negative stuff. And, you know, I remember I, I thought about myself as somebody kind of wise just <laughs> growing up or being a young wise person that even in my adult life, I thought like, oh, where, ha where has she gone? You know, when I have felt confronted. She's still there. <laughs> when I have still there. Yeah, well, she is. I have I have definitely yeah. recognized that. But mm -hmm. it, let's say in, in difficult moments of already mm -hmm. adulthood that I would remember like, hey, I used to do this as a teenager mm -hmm. um, and that has helped me. So I cannot say that I have gotten rid of it because there have been certain, yeah, of course, adulthood situations where we're still, you know, um, yeah, I'm about to s start this journey also as an entrepreneur and, and let alone, you know, in tech which is something I have, you know, never been involved with. And yeah, clearly sometimes it knocks on my door, but honestly, I feel really way more relaxed than I used to uh, when I started with calculus back in university. I think it also comes with age, potentially. Mm -hmm. I just read an HBR article that says that women uh, at a younger age have a huge gap in terms of confidence versus guys, but the gap starts closing by the time they reach 40. Mm -hmm. I am far from 40 yet, but <laughs> I'm, getting <there. laughs> I'm getting there. And by the time the gap, by the time you're 60, apparently guys start losing confidence and women feel top of their game. So mm -hmm. I think because I'm getting closer to 40, probably that's also helping. Yeah. Okay. Andrea. Andrea? Um, well, for me, it was really uh, hearing about this topic. And I, I actually don't remember when I heard the concept. It might have been maybe when I was uh, talking with my sister. She's a, a psychiatrist, so we always have some mm -hmm. conversations. But I remember that I was blown. I was, wow, yes, wow. How come I never knew about it? And I think this is the first step, becoming aware of it and kind of building your own emotional strategy. How are you going to manage your own emotions? I think that's, that's life-changing. And I always enjoy seeing someone or having a conversation with someone about this for the first time and seeing the look on their face. Like, yes, I felt that as well, both men and women. So I, I think becoming aware of it and just knowing that you are not uh, by yourself, mm -hmm. uh, that really helps. And I was also um, very helped by the fact that there's so many high accomplished uh, women and men out there that have experienced it. I mean, Emma Watson also experienced uh, this. So it's, it's yeah, if they can still continue and be amazing, nothing is uh, stopping us as well. Definitely love it. And uh, Daniela? Well, um, I would add actually, because you're, 
guys already <laughs> gave a definition of how it is useful to recognize it, right? You need to accept we have it and just uh, get in touch with it. <laughs> yeah, hi, imposter, you were here. So what I do with it now, the reaction. And one thing that I do is recognizing my accomplishments, writing mm -hmm. them down and actually using facts to uh, bring on the to the table to myself, right? And uh, working on this self-talk, you know, uh, avoiding uh, the negative self-talk. And what helps is a lot is uh, when I think about something uh, negative, I try to switch. So why you were thinking that, Daniela? What's the fact behind it? Mm -hmm. If there is no fact, it's, it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> and so let's find also facts that are actually positive. So it's your accomplishments. If you need to uh, promote yourself uh, in a company or with your business, look for facts and acknowledge what you have done as well. It's very important. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's just uh, what you guys said, having someone to be there and share these feelings, but also bringing more dialogue, like in schools, in companies, everywhere. If we talk about that, we bring more awareness and uh, men and women and any underrepresented group, because it's not only that woman that has more, but any person who feels like minority, Mm -hmm. will feel uh, as a fraud more than the rest. Yeah. It doesn't mean the others are not. <laughs> yeah, and I I totally get uh, what the other ladies are sharing. So recently I had Wies, uh, Wies Bradby on the show, and one of the things that she is recommending is having a brag book. Uh, having a brag book so that you, on a daily basis, share uh, the accomplishment that you have been doing. Sometimes I forget, and the people that have been with me from the beginning that I started my career, I sometimes forget that I, I had my own cooking show. I had been producing my own cooking show. And people seem to think like this, doing this is the first time that I'm doing it. But I have been doing lives way before. The only thing is that I was at the time when I finished, I was suffering from the imposter syndrome because who does she think that she is? She is an RTO4 or whatever. Who, you know, there are so many things that popped up. And I was being my worst critic. So what helped me during that stage is I have my inner circle. I have a few WhatsApp groups when I doubt, when I feel in doubt or when I am uh, suffering from some of the symptoms, the imposter syndrome symptoms, I ask them to hold up the mirror because sometimes you can be so conflicted with yourself that doing you know, the mirror work with yourself can be a bit challenging and I have a few close friends sometimes they are annoying that's how annoying and I love them they know they know that about me but I love them but sometimes they can be very annoying because they are holding the mirror so close and upfront for me to see is it true what I'm saying about myself or is it false and once I recognize that I know how to how to do that even my partner does it from time to time using my own words which is which is the worst but I, I love him, so, uh, and my, my son, Orlando, does this as well. So I, it helps to have those people around you who can uh, showcase that mirror so that you see, you recognize the value and the power that you bring. Because sometimes I don't realize how much of, how many people are watching this, how many people you are touching. And so many, I see so many, I hear so many, you know, comments from people who have seen it or who have watched it or who have known about my name without me even realizing it. So what I want to say is do something about the imposter syndrome and keep on doing something because in a way the imposter syndrome is also there to challenge you to keep on going out of your comfort zone. So that's what I wanted to share. And Lara. Um, so very quickly, I mm -hmm. started realizing um, when I worked in corporate, I was just, um, for me, it was just my mind and nothing else. I would never mm. check in with my body. I had yeah. never heard of a body check-in. <laughs> when I started checking in with my body, I realized that I had a stomach ache all the time, all mm -hmm. the time. It was always something tense, always something hurting. And that's when I realized that you know, I was putting all this pressure on myself because of this feeling, this fear, right? 
And um, when you asked about how is it that I've overcome this, um, I just decided to believe that whenever I do something, I do the best that I can. I just mm -hmm. I just put everything into it. And if it sucks, <laughs> then it sucks. But I know that I really I put everything into it. There's nothing else I can do. What I can do is look back and say, okay, this next time I can do this different. Maybe next time yeah. I can do, but not just not beating myself up anymore yeah. about everything that I do. That's a great one. Thank you. And lastly. Um, yeah, so, I mean, recognizing the, the syndrome, you know, um, I wish that it was just like you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I think I have the syndrome, and then you just take an action. But um, it, it, in my case, I, I, I didn't even realize that it was a syndrome, you know, it was just, you know, like I'm living, um, you know, in a corporate world, and just, you know, just Lara was saying, it was just my mind, you know, it was just I had to be successful. And when I started um, doing this like a self-talk, you know, you just realize that you're actually talking to yourself at home mm -hmm. as well. So, um, and, and, and my husband actually just, you know, was there and was helping me to, you know, really empower and just say, okay, when I said I'm not good enough, and he's like, no, you are good at us. You know, when I'm just, you know, I'm not worthy. Yes, you are. And just being patient and just really showing the way um, to, to kind of take care of my body, because when I also realized that, like Laura was saying that it's not even stomach pain, you know, like my face, you know, like during the meeting one day, it was just become numb. Like my heartbeat just, you know, mm -hmm. start going so fast. And I said, you know, like consciously, I think I'm having a heart attack. I don't know what that is, but wow. I was actually like the body from a mind to body. I see the reflection very clearly. Um, so, and how did I get rid of it? I mean, just for, you know, like our conversation with Daniela, it, it's not gone, but three years ago, you know, really just writing a journal, you know, I love poetry. So I started writing poems. Um, it's interesting that I can only write poems in, in Turkish, but I can read in three different languages. Mm -hmm. So when I just, you know, getting my, uh, my feelings out there, you know, about my son, about my life, you know, um, and to all of your point, like accomplishment, you know, and I started, you know, starting you know like trying to find my purpose right you know just going through this like a childhood influences just like everybody that was talking about you know what are the some of the roles that i have played what are the some of the roles that i have been influenced to um so doing this exercise just really helped me to um you know just the raising the self-awareness so and to 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 lara's point and the others you know like if i'm just gonna mess up i'm gonna mess up so yeah. I, I think one of the, you know, one of the good thing about being an entrepreneur um, or, you know, just going out with your, you know, with your website or your business, it's a very messy road, but it's fun. Yeah. You know, you become more creative, you know, you're just, you know, um, recognizing your success in a much better way. Um, so I, I guess that's just, this is how I'm actually dealing with that syndrome if I just have this, um, this fear of, you know, failure. I'm just more embracing that. That's a good tip. And I know, Melissa, you are about to go. I just want to ask you one question before you go. Um, what is the tip Thanks. that you have for us to co um, to support current and next generation of women and men with beating this imposter syndrome? Yeah, well, that's that's a ha that's a mouthful of a question, <laughs> of course. But I think. Um, I think it's going to be very important, especially for women, that there are more role models out there. So all of you right now out here and you, Vivian, with this platform, I really, really hope that we you know, can reach a lot of also younger women uh, so that they know that they are not alone. And hopefully, you know, as women also come more on the ranks, um, that's, that it can also be OK to fail for us that you know failing is okay going back to where you know my parents and the grades and at school etc missing a year or like having you know lost a year on an exam or something was just not conceivable right yeah. and yeah. sometimes you do need that to shake you to say you know you need to take a certain path so failing is okay so we need more role models and we need people to tell girls that failing 
it's it's fine. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and when it comes to um, to guys, I think being you know quoting my friend Jens van Tricht, um, who is the founder of Emancipator and also the the writer of the book Why um, All Men Should Be Feminist as well. It's it's about being human before being a man. You know, allowing mm-hmm. boys and allowing men also to to be human before putting also all the different constructs and fabrication that society has put in the boxes where where men need to fit in. Um, I think also a lot of that is driving imposter syndrome in men when they feel emasculated, where they feel that they are not man enough to, you know, if you're the not the main breadwinner at home, then you're not man enough. Or if you're taking care of a kid at home, then you're not man enough. Mm-hmm. That's all BS, of course. And yeah. we need to also build the space and the role models for for guys as well to be able to be human um, so that they can read of it. So that's a little bit of a long answer, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you um, for being here and um, love to have you here and hope to, you know, you have a good dinner with your partner and uh, thank you for your valuable insight. Thank you. And thank you all ladies. Keep on rocking. <laughs> bye, bye. 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 And the rest, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, building, um, um, becoming allies for mm-hmm. the younger generation, that, that is very important. And having the emotional space uh, to uh, uh, to share with others what, what your experiences are and what your tips and tricks are, I think that is a first and quite an achievable step to do, even in, a, in, in corporate. Um, now, having, you know, in a diversity and inclusiveness um, team, is already a big step because you can have these discussions. Those people are usually quite passionate about it. But I would say for any you know young person working in corporate and maybe experiencing this, uh, find some allies, find some people that can uh, guide you and mentor you through the uh, organization. If that doesn't work, there's plenty of ways to network and find those allies that can. Mm-hmm. Uh, can support you in, you know, kicking that imposter or uh, shutting it uh, down uh, from time to time. Yeah, Daniela? I think you said a lot already, but I would add being a mentor uh, also teaching, because when you put in, in practice what you actually feel as a fraud, you're gonna actually pass the knowledge and, and uh, help others. So it always, come through a circle as like a learning mm-hmm. and uh, fighting this uh, imposter syndrome and uh, yeah but you're gonna actually act in this um, syndrome that we were actually uh, considering as an unknown thing and avoiding it and that, yeah. that's it it's like dialogue a lot of dialogue Important. Yeah, and also know that you know there are so many positive sides of you becoming a mentee, but also you becoming a mentor. You learn so much yeah. about yourself. You learn yeah. so much about your mentee, and it can give you that confidence boost for you to uh, put you know put a sticker on the mouth of the imposter so that you won't hear that imposter anymore. And um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Lara. Um, for me, I think everyone said everything about Mm -hmm. this but for me um being able to transmit for my daughter this is what i think when we're thinking about other generations i think about my daughter she's Mm -hmm. six and what i try to explain to her is that her emotions are valid Mm -hmm. and that if she's feeling it um it's it's normal like there are many other people who are feeling it as well so um i think that we need a space to really um put on the scale you know, what our emotions are, um, how they're moving us forward and how you know, they they make us just interact with everyone and how we work and, and everything we do. And so um, I, I wish there was more of a space where both men and women, we could speak um, more openly about um, these emotions that we are feeling and mm-hmm. we could validate them as well. Yeah, that's a good thing. And lastly? Um, so to, to me, like if people with um, Im- imposter syndrome, you know, find it hard to accept compliments. Mm-hmm. Um, so when things go well, you know, they're like, okay, the, the good, good, 
good thing, you know, good fortune or, you know, luck. But when something goes wrong, they blame themselves, mm -hmm. like especially in corporate world, you know, that I have been for 15 years. So what I would um, recommend, you know, like just a few um, tips that, you know, develop a new script. So your script is that auto automatic mental tape, right? That starts playing in a situation that it just starts triggering, you know, like a pro imposter, you know, feeling. Like when you start a new job or a new project, um, you know, like um, instead of saying like, wait until they find out that I have no idea what I'm doing, even if you know what you're doing, yeah. try to think that everyone who starts something new yeah. feels off base in the beginning. I might not know all the answers, but I'm smart en enough to find them out. Um, and the other one is that the visualizing success, you know, just like athletes, you know, professional athletes do. So spend time beforehand, you know, like picturing yourself making a successful presentation or going to a webinar or just presenting your project. Um, it really helps to, you know, like also rewarding your success. You know, just everybody talks. It's really um, reward yourself, empower yourself. And um, I think the last one that, you know, like I personally experienced um, is that don't wait until you feel confident to start putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, courage comes from taking risks. Yeah. And I remember when I was launching my website, you know, when I when I launched it, I was like, oh, my God, what happened now? And I had no idea what to expect. And and changing your behavior and, you know, how you think uh, first and then allow your confidence to, to build over time. Yeah, I truly can uh, can relate to what you are saying. Also, what Lara is saying, because one of the things that my son is listening or is learning at school is learning about the growth mindset he's yeah. uh he started from you know from from the the age of four each year they have a different level of teaching the kids how they can embrace the growth mindset even i we as parents we are learning from that and also letting my son know that it's okay to fail or it's okay to be angry it's okay to whatever emotion that you have because uh, we need to have a space. We need to have a, a dialogue about it. And then we also need to know that we don't have to fool ourselves because uh, would you imagine, could you imagine that even the creator of um, uh, Facebook, like Mark Zuckerberg, he also suffers from imposter syndrome. Everybody suffers from imposter syndrome. The yeah. only thing is that not everybody shows it, not everybody shares it, and not everybody is uh, sharing these stories. And uh, the first time, what helped me in the beginning there is this book from Valerie Young, which I read and which made the aha moment. I forgot the title, but the title, uh, Valerie Young, when you Google her, Imposter Syndrome and Valerie Young, it opened so much my eyes. It, it made me see my, my idols, my role models in the same level of where I am. Even though they have the years of experience, I can look them in the eye and I know that they have their own dose of imposter syndrome. And uh, to me, it's not a way of me seeing that, ah, ha, ha, oh, they have it too. To me, it's a way to relate to them that they have their own struggles and challenges and they have overcome it. So what can I learn from them to overcome it so that I can be, you know, that next person to overcome it? Because... Uh, again, I don't see myself as Oprah. I am inspired by her and I'm learning a lot from her, learning a lot from other role models, but I want to see them as human. We need to see each other as human and realize, you know, after behind every successful person and successful can be defined in so many varieties. We need to see that behind that, there is a human, there is a person, and there is somebody who has so many emotions. And sometimes we tend to forget that. So I just also want to highlight a few of the comments. Um, Toki is sharing, yep, failure has was never an option. Now I'm starting to understand that it can be a learning experience and help me face the fear of failure. Thank you for sharing this. And I don't know how, if I'm, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but thank you for, uh, thank you for joining and thank you for commenting. So embrace the good enough approach. And I, I like that. Yeah. Also a highlight to a shout out to David, David Pushkin. Go great conversation. The key theme is resonating here for me is having an internal dialogue and giving yourself the space to be in that dialogue and work through a solution. Yes. Nice. Michael, who is a fan, Michael, you can be what you can see. And I can definitely relate to that. We need more role models and we need more 
conversations. And that's why, you know, with humanizing the workplace, uh, I know that I am touching on some uh, maybe taboo topics or maybe topics that shouldn't be real related to humanizing the workplace. But without me, it wouldn't be me and it wouldn't be human if I wouldn't include this conversation, this topic into it. And I think that we need to have more of these conversations in the workplace in a safe uh, physiologically safe environment to have these conversations because otherwise um, it won't be helpful for people to learn and grow if they don't feel safe in that environment. So, and Jabez is saying, courage comes for taking the risk. Nasli, you have a fan. Powerful statement. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Deborah Burton is saying, wow, Deborah, thank you for watching. I have been a fan. I am a fan of her. And she says, stay strong and always know you are good enough, smart enough, and strong enough. Thank you, Deborah, for sharing your comments. I really appreciate it. And um, coming to the last question. So what is your wish for 2025 when it comes to humanizing the workplace and also dismantling imposter syndrome? What is your wish maybe for your child or for your future generation or just in general? What is your wish for yourself? So I'll start with Nasli. Well, um, so, you know, the other day I was, uh, I was riding a bike with my son mm -hmm. and, um, and he's seven years old and, uh, he, um, he shout out, he's like, Hey mom, you know, it's okay if I fall. Isn't that mm. the whole thing about learning? Yeah. And I had to, I had to stop and question myself, you know, if I was just saying this when I was seven years old, mm -hmm. so I, I have good faith with the generation. So they're yeah. more aware of their feelings. And like you were saying, growth mindset. Yeah. I would love to see it grow up mindset with very um, strong psychological safety in, in the workplaces. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean, psychological safety, it touches to a lot of, you know, inclusion, right? We yeah. cannot just be diverse. You know, we are diverse already, you know, even being on this call, uh, we are, we are calling from different parts of the world. So mm -hmm. inclusion uh, is where it comes, you know, like psychologically being safe to just to share what your feelings are. And I'm really hoping that, um, with the technology growing so fast, um, you know, uh, more creative things, more purposeful, uh, you know, entrepreneurs um, really just bring in their authentic self to in the workplaces. Thank you, Daniela. Wow, she said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Did she read your script? <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, it's just uh, the sense of belonging, right? Uh, when you talk about inclusion, um, how I see in 2025 uh, leaders with a more awareness of the inclusive leadership approach, being really uh, the one who creates this culture of uh, humans first like a uh, real sense of I can speak up, I can uh, give my opinion, I can cheer up myself and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the way I think we're gonna get a little more rid of uh, this imposter syndrome. So I, I want to see the next generation like thriving and uh, less afraid of, uh, you know, failure, like failure, you need to accept it. We actually, actually talked about it. So it's very important that we bring down uh, this mindset, the growth mindset. I love this, that you, your kid is having uh, in so early stage, this study uh, about growth mindset. It's just amazing. It is, it is definitely amazing. I, I always tell the, the director of the school that I really praise them for sharing that because a lot of adults can use you know some of this growth set mind uh, <laughs> technology so definitely and and lara um one thought that's come up with me with this idea i love the growth mindset and i feel that if we all had it we would all help we would all feel more empowered and we'd mm -hmm. help others to feel more empowered as well with the everything that's gone with the coronavirus and what's been happening lately i've felt that we have the possibility of moving more towards a um, feeling that we're all in this together. And so if um, we're working and um, we're in a workplace and we feel that we're all contributing, not just to ourselves and not just trying to get ahead, but we're contributing also to 
the other person, right? We're in this together. I feel that it would be so, it would just be such a difference from what it is to today. And um, going back to what I mentioned, I never felt anybody reach out to me and say, hey, you know what? I think you're putting too much pressure on yourself. I mm -hmm. think that if we had more of this mindset that we're all in this together, we could help others to, to see what's happening with them, to see that yeah. they're putting themselves in a pressure that, you know, isn't unnecessary. Definitely. And Andrea? Uh, I really liked what, uh, what Lala just mentioned. And uh, I guess in uh, 2025, my son will be almost seven. So yes. uh, hopefully he already knows about the growth mindset. But I, I do think that the imposter syndrome will not go away because it's, mm -hmm. it is something that is um, innate to, to the humans. And because uh, the uh, type of work that uh, we are starting to do is more creative and uh, requires more uh, from us being in in uh, in the zone, let's say. Um, but I hope that by 2025 it will be um, uh, just just uh, a routine to talk about uh, how you feel and to be in check with your own emotions and have you know your own strategy and uh, yeah checking with your body as well. So I hope that that will be just uh, institutionalized in all uh, all companies or academia and in government. That it will not be a taboo to uh, uh, acknowledge that you might feel uh, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, I, I can totally agree. And before um, ending the show, um, I do have to say that before all before me becoming an entrepreneur, what I did with compliments, I was the Serena Williams. I had my tennis racket and I beat them away because I was just like, OK, <laughs> this is not for me. It's not an effort. But then all of a sudden, I realized that every time that I'm doing that, I'm not acknowledging the grade in me. I'm not seeing the great value that I have. And now I'm just like, okay, keep, keep on coming because I have, I am collecting, you know, a, a mood board with all the goodies that people share because I need that from time to time. When I feel like my imposter syndrome is taking an overhand, that mood board is helping me. Uh, when I feel like um, I don't know where I'm coming from or where what I've done to be here, I look back. So one of the things that I like about Facebook and sometimes Google Photos, they um, share those moments from three years ago, from two years ago, and sometimes you tend to forget those moments. So I would say put a reminder in your calendar and reflect, look uh, upon what you did a few years ago and see what you have done to be here to to do this platform or to have this conversation online or to speak up because you put in the work you put in the time you put in the energy and you also um let's say that you up leveled yourself let's say you leveled up and we need to acknowledge that as well because we tend to forget the little the baby steps and sometimes when we are there at the finish point we don't acknowledge where we come from. So when you start, when you stand at the finish line, look back and acknowledge every little step you took to get to the finish line. And once in a while, look back as well that you made, you know, you got that medal, you were, you are a success and reflect upon that from time to time because we need those reminders to see the great that we are doing. So before, don't go yet, I'm just going to announce uh, next week's talk, but know that I am utterly proud. I appreciate you for being this vulnerable because um, it can be a touchy subject, but the way you brought it and the way you all shared, you know, your personal experience and the way you helped others, I truly believe that those who are watching or those who are listening to this conversation can really feel empowered by saying that they are not alone and you are definitely not alone in this journey. So I'm going to uh, announce the speakers of next week. So next week we have uh, Ebre Akadiri and Hasiba Saban, and we are going to talk about rise and lead of women of color. And I also have a Dutch announcement. I haven't done a Dutch show in a long, long time. So next week we have a few of the panel members. I'm going to have a, a Dutch conversation on Thursday, next week, Thursday, and it will be about the power of mentorship. I am going to touch in on to do some of the Dutch episodes, but know that every Tuesday 
I will make an effort to do this humanizing the workplace in English. And uh, if you're watching or if you are tuning in right now, know that we have a podcast or know that it is a podcast so you can consume humanizing the workplace at your own pace or look back into the YouTube. Uh, also know that you can subscribe to uh, to uh, bit.ly htw news so that you can decide who am I going to interview or you can even contribute into the questions, right? Because I can't do it all alone. I need your help. Now is the time that you can have a say. So I want to thank my guest speakers of today and I urge you, not urge you, I advise you to connect with them because they are all they are they are all awesome. And next week we have more awesome people. So thank you. I see just one comment I'm going to share with you. Oh Deborah, thank you, Deborah. Uh, <laughs> that's this this one goes to my heart. So thank you, Deborah. I am proud of you as well and i am taking it all in i'm just taking it all in thank <laughs> you for watching and until right. next time bye thank, thank you, you so much, much. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Bye. thank you thank you